Um, my name is Sarah Nizzi. I'm a pollinator conservation planner and NRCS partner biologist. And when I say NRCS, I mean the Natural Resource Conservation Service, which is a branch of the USDA, just for clarification. Um, so today myself, as well as my counterpart, Ray Powers, who has a very similar position, uh, will be presenting to you today on supporting pollinators over time, how to maintain wildflower diversity. So first and foremost, um, hello from the Midwest. I am based in Iowa. I primarily work with um, landowners and producers who are interested in implementing habitat um, on their land, as well as assisting NRCS staff and their partner staff with anything um, related to pollinators, management, seed mixes, um, specs and standards, et cetera. I help create and review publications as well as do education and outreach. Um, Ray has a very similar position. She is based in Lincoln, Nebraska, but also covers South Dakota. Um, so although we, um, by and large, our experience stems from the Midwest and for Ray, parts of the Great Plains, um, by no means is this going to be a Midwest-centric webinar. So um, rest assured that we will um, have pictures from different regions and be talking about different regions and um, case studies from all over the continental U.S. All right, so today's outline, I'm gonna briefly do our kind of usual Xerces introduction and then dive into diversity and why it matters, um, and then get into monitoring, evaluating management strategies, case studies, and then lastly, of course, additional resources. So today's webinar will be focusing on a specific publication that came out just a few years ago, um, and we'll take a deep dive into that to help us walk through these things. So I think most of the audience is probably pretty familiar and aware of the Xerces Society and what we do, but um, just to be sure, I wanna clarify that we're an international nonprofit organization that is based in Portland, Oregon. We were founded in 1971, and we work to preserve uh, wildlife through the conservation of invertebrates and their habitat. And we do this in a number of different ways. Um, the bulk of our staff is made up of the pollinator team, and basically we work together to diversify the agricultural landscape. We have an endangered species team that does an amazing job of giving voice to imperiled and often underrepresented species. A small but very mighty pesticide team who keeps us up to date on all things pesticide related um, in regards to research and other, um, other happenings and comes out with some pretty cool publications and a few folks working within the um, urban communities with cities and towns and college campuses to diversify those landscapes for pollinators, uh, work with volunteers and provide education and outreach. This is a map of our pollinator staff. Um, so it's about half of the Xerces staff or fall within the pollinator team. And we're kind of split between working within the public sector. So like myself and Ray Powers as partner biologists with NRCS, there are several others that are um, working with NRCS at either a state scale, multi-state, or even a regional um, basis. And then other folks who are within the private sector working with larger growers, companies, and other entities. So we do not do this amazing work by ourselves. Um, it takes many, many, many people to allow us to do this really important work. Um, and we cannot thank all of our individual members. Your contribution makes a huge difference. Um, the foundations, the many partner scientists, farmers, um, other agencies at the state, federal, local level, and the many, many thousands of people who are you know, doing what they can in their niche of the world to um, conserve pollinators and other uh, beneficial insects. And we um, do this important work because you know, more and more we are learning that there are declines in the abundance, biomass, and diversity of insects and other invertebrates uh, globally. And although we welcome um, more research, certainly based off of what we do know, we know enough that we should be acting now. Um, pollinators are pollinators and other beneficial insects are extremely important to our 
um, environment, to our food systems, and also to um, wildlife and their food webs. More locally, um, in North America, 28% of bumblebees are at risk and 18% of our butterflies are at risk. Um, photo here is of a regal fritillary, and it is considered a rare specialist species, and it is in decline as well as many other rare specialist pollinators. But not only are the specialist species declining, but our more general species that were once considered very common are also declining, for example, the monarch butterfly. Luckily, uh, there is way, there are ways to reverse these declines. Um, these organisms can be quite resilient if they are able to um, have the tools and the support they need in order to be successful. And habitat is the number one conservation action that anyone can take at nearly any scale um, to help reverse these declines. Components of habitat include food resources, nesting and overwintering sites, um, breeding opportunities. We want to be sure that individuals are able to find one another within close proximity, as well as protection from pesticides. And when we have all of these components working together, pollinators and other um, beneficial insects and invertebrates can complete their entire life cycle and survive long term. When we think about habitat, um, there's a lot of different, you know, types of habitat out there to consider whether that be hedgerows, um, perennial native and sectary strips, pollinator meadows, woodland ecosystems, um, or even a farm bill planting, like a conservation reserve program planting. Um, so there's you know, different scales, different acreages, different landscapes in which these can exist and support pollinators. This is the document that we will be um, covering today. I have one here handy right by my side. And um, this was created just a couple of years ago before my time with Circe's. And really the main goal was to provide a resource on how to manage these pollinator plantings. There are lots of resources out there for plant selection, seed mixes, site prep, planting, establishment, but there's not as much information on how we should be managing and maintaining these plantings for the long term. So that is um, the goal of this publication. It's um, pretty, pretty comprehensive. There's a lot of really good stuff in there. So we'll um, just be covering uh, basically the big key, key components of it, like the characteristics of functional habitats. So what we consider um, high quality habitat, kind of the bar at which we're trying to reach management processes, their strategies, the techniques, um, and which one is most appropriate for your setting, and of course, additional resources. And I should also say that um, when it comes to pollinator plantings and really any diverse planting, whether it's just, you know, trying to support wildlife in general, um, management is key in order for it to remain successful. Um, there could have been hiccups with the seed mix or maybe the site prep or maybe the establishment period that may have set it back just a little, but um, that doesn't mean that the planting is necessarily going to be a failure, but if we're able to monitor and evaluate and manage, you know, we can make up for some of those um, potential losses or, or hiccups that could have happened in the the planning in the beginning stages of the process. Um, management's usually considered roughly around, you know, depending on the habitat type, let's say we're talking about pollinator meadows, uh, year four, maybe five. If you have a planting that is part of a farm bill program, you may be required to do some sort of management activity in years four or five based on your contract. Um, but it just really depends on how well the establishment went and um, that may be, you know, kind of a, a case by case site specific scenario, but generally around that time frame, that's when we kind of start thinking about um, how to implement these practices. And I'll also note that this document is geared towards plantings within agricultural landscapes that are a half acre up to five acres in size. 
Um, but certainly this document could still be helpful for those larger five plus acre plantings um, and you know, other things you can take away from it. So when we think about the characteristics of functional habitat, there are a few things that we like to see. Basically a diversity of desirable plant species um, that are well balanced and even. So not just one dominant single species overtaking the planting. Um, of course, we wanna ensure that we have bloom throughout the entire growing season. That is absolutely critical for pollinators. So early spring, all the way into fall, uh, also want to be sure that the dominant plant species there are you know, what we intended. So they're the wildflowers that we want, not necessarily weeds. And are they able to persist over time? Um, making sure that we didn't just have a bunch of flowers in year three, then come year five, for whatever reason, they're, abs they're absent. Um, and if there are unwanted species present, are they present at a threshold that's not going to cause significant damage. Um, we, in a lot of the restoration work that we do, we're trying to replicate historical conditions and plant native plants that were once there, um, but we are human and we're never gonna be as good as mother nature you know, once was a long time ago. So we will have to live um, in some cases with some you know, species that might not be native, but as long as they're not detrimental to the planting, you know, that can be okay too. And in my case, we have smooth brome everywhere. And um, there are times where, you know, it might just exist, but as long as it's not dominating, you can continue to still manage it and try to reduce it. Um, but it doesn't mean it's the end all be all for the planting. So diversity is important because it increases overall biodiversity and functionality to support a wide array of wildlife, as well as increasing soil health, um, filtering water, being resistant to plant invasion, so not allowing those unwanted species to creep in and take over, being resilient to extreme weather events like drought, for example. Um, basically all of those things and ensuring that we have diversity kind of creates its own immune system or defense mechanism uh, to withstand for the long term. Now, briefly, I'm just going to get into basically the, the ingredients of diversity. So we say diversity, we um, know that it has these benefits, but what does that really mean? How do we achieve diversity? Well, functional plant groups is a great place to start. And when we are building seed mixes or selecting plants, these are really great considerations to keep in mind. Or, you know, if something was left out in the process in the beginning, we can strive to fill these gaps if needed through management. So we like to see cool season native grasses, as well as warm season native grasses. In some places, if it's applicable, you know, including sedges is really beneficial, and rushes if um, the region and soil types make sense, wildflowers, of course, and then those woody species. So cool season grasses are grasses that are actively growing um, in the springtime. So they green up really you know, quickly. And then when summer, the heat or the, the peak of the growing season, they go dormant. Then once temperatures cool down again, um, they reemerge and green back up. Warm season grasses, like it suggests, they peak and grow during the, um, the warm season. So the, the growing season and wildflowers, we wanna be sure that we have um, perennials, short and long lived included, biannuals, annuals, um, legumes, a large diversity of wildflowers. Um, in some cases, it makes more sense to just have the annuals because um, for whatever reason, you know, maybe perennials aren't available or what have you, you know, that is okay. Um, but trying to increase and have as much diversity in that regard as possible to fill in all of those niches. And they each kind of have their place at their own time, you know, maybe earlier in the planting, then showing up later in the planting, so on and so forth. Woody species are critical. Trees and shrubs, um, oftentimes many species are host plants for a huge amount of Lepidoptera, so butterflies and moths. And they also provide um, some of the most early spring um, forage before other wildflowers are breeding. 
And Xerxes can't stress this enough. We need to have abundant flowers throughout the entire growing season. So making sure that we're um, meeting that mark in this um, publication really helps us kind of evaluate and monitor for that and see if there are any gaps that may need to be filled. And back to the diversity of wildflowers, we want to be sure that we're selecting species from different families. Uh, we want to be sure that we are supporting generalist species as well as specialist species. So generalists are those that are um, able to forage on a buffet of things. You know, they will kind of um, be opportunistic and have a broad palette where specialist species um, may only be able to forage and feed their young on certain pollen and nectar of specific plants or um, families. So now that we have a basic understanding of diversity, kind of what that means, uh, what's in that mix, now we're gonna start thinking about uh, monitoring and evaluating. So questions that we're going to often ask are, you know, is what we planted um, present? Uh, are there any species or which ones um, dominating? Do we have a diversity in each season? And are we um, providing bloom throughout the entire growing season? And are there any problematic weeds? And these questions really help guide us as to, you know, potentially the frequency of management, the type of management we might use, et cetera. So this document um, walks you through this whole process on how to monitor. Uh, we recommend monitoring every two to four weeks throughout one um, season. So that includes spring, summer, fall, and even the dormant season. Um, evaluating that data, so what do we have? Um, you know, where are we at on the bar and then deciding, do we need immediate management now? Um, are there some things that can kind of sit on the back burner? You know, where are we at? And then of course, continuously re-evaluating. Um, it's important to over time, just consistently know what's going on and be able to track whether your management decisions are, um, you know, meeting your goal and expectations and providing the habitat for pollinators that you intended. Within the document, we have these forms and there are um, set examples on how to fill these out, but there's a spot where you can record your entire installation um, plan. So when you planted, how you planted, what you planted, et cetera. And we'll walk through some of these forms in more detail. But then again, you know, recording what you have, recording what you have over um, several years worth of time, and then being able to log your management. So you can record when you're doing something, what you're doing, and see if it's working or not working. So the monitoring form, this is for just one season. So you um, each time will record the species present. You're gonna mark whether they are flowers, grasses, trees, or shrubs, if applicable, whether they're flowering or not flowering, and then um, the abundance within the planting. And so down below, you'll see that we have thresholds to kind of help guide you on uh, what we mean by abundance. So 50% or more, rare is 10% or less. And of course, if it's not there, then it's, it's not present and it doesn't get a score. Um, again, this is to help us track and be sure that we are covering our bloom period um, so that pollinators are being supported through forage. And we're gonna do the same thing for unwanted species. Document what we have, whether they're a flower, um, a grass, tree, or shrub, whether they're flowering or not flowering, the abundance within the planting, and then basically how problematic are they? Uh, generally, a pretty good rule of thumb is that perennials tend to be a lot more problematic than, say, annuals. Uh, you may have issues with the annuals early on in the planting, but over time, might not be much of a headache. So you can prioritize um, your weed pressure. And then this is the form where you're able to record um, your monitoring over different years. 
which is really handy again to just you know see where you're at and um, how things are going over time. So now that we've talked about evaluation and monitoring, we're going to get into management. So there are multiple management techniques um, that are applicable, you know, depending on where you're at, the size and scale of your planting, et cetera. Um, I just want to say that management, it's, it's very hard to make blanket management recommendations. I personally do not feel comfortable giving people advice on management um, unless I have been there and I have seen it and I know what's going on with my very own eyes. Um, you could have planted something and the neighbor across the road did, had the same contractor, had the same seed mix. I've seen that before, but it doesn't mean that you're necessarily fighting the same battles or having the same battles. So they're very um, case by case and site specific. And I should also mention, I forgot to mention this earlier, I'm going to hand off the presentation midway through this management um, section and Ray is, Ray is going to kick it off at grazing. So first and foremost, when we think about management, we do not want to go into this blindly. We do not want to be willy nilly with management. We need to have a goal in mind. Um, if there is no goal, we're kind of going out there without purpose and you could be potentially um, adversely affecting your planting versus, um, you know, doing doing it good. So some examples of goals that folks may or may not have is, are there specific, a specific weed or multiple weeds that you wanna tackle? Um, do you need to increase wildflower diversity um, to fill bloom gaps or for whatever reason? Do you need to fill other gaps? Uh, maybe you're having issues with cool season grasses and you realize that initially in the seed mix, you didn't have native cool seasons in there. Um, so you don't have them competing for that space. You can add those in um, or potentially increase them through management, or you could have all of these problems or you know goals in mind and simultaneously be trying to address them. And I also want to say that when we think about management and we're selecting practices, we want to be sure that we are picking a practice that will be increasing diversity as well as combating our target issues. So we wanna be um, controlling unwanted species and also increasing diversity at the same time. It's also extremely important to understand your target. Uh, when it comes to weed control, it is extremely beneficial to know the phenology and the biology of the plant, uh, which you know, may be your demise. Uh, Canada thistle is a pretty common widespread issue across many different regions. Um, it is critical to make sure that you disrupt its reproductive um, cycle. And Canada thistle reproduces by seed, but it also can reproduce and grow through rhizomes and its extensive root systems. So that's something that's really important to know. It's a perennial, that's really important to know. Um, there's also ways that we can um, invigorate weedy species. So you wanna be sure that you're not actually stimulating growth, but that you're inhibiting it. Um, so to continue with the Canada thistle example, it's um, extremely important to make sure that you are cutting off the flowers either at bud or at flowering stage. And, um, you know, potentially not mowing too short because you could be invigorating that root system. And just knowing that, especially with perennials, it's gonna take time. Uh, reed canary grass is another big issue, um, but honestly, there's no shortage of invasive species. You know, some people are fighting teasel, Cerecia lespedeza, cheat grass, Medusa grass, mustards, other annuals, leafy spurge. I mean, there's a huge, um, yeah, there's lots. <laughs> there's lots that you could be um, facing and just understanding uh, the plant will really help you be effective and timing your management appropriately to be most effective. 
There are a number of different ways we can reduce the threat of weeds. Um, you know, these might make sense just depending on the scale of, of you know, the size of your planting. So if hand weeding or spot spraying um, is an option because it's smaller, great. Um, grass selective herbicides can be beneficial um, for spot treatments for certain non-native cool season grasses. Uh, if you have a significantly larger planting, you know, you might have to go out there with an ATV to do your spot spraying. We can mow for weed control. And I've kind of, I've already alluded to this, that um, that can be beneficial and not depending on the timing and um, how it is done. So for annuals, generally once is good. We want to be able to mow them, you know, at flowering stage prior to seed set. For perennials, oftentimes you're going to have to do it multiple times in a growing season. Um, again, Canada thistle, great example. You could mow at bud stage and while it's flowering, but there, it's very likely that later in the season it is going to try to reflower and um, try to reproduce or produce seeds again. So you're going to have to go back uh, continuously and likely for multiple seasons. Um, again, you might not want to mow things really short because you could be invigorating a root system and encouraging that growth. So I think a safe bet with a lot of these weeds is just mowing or cutting back um, the flower stalks at a pretty high height if you're able. And then of course, if um, spot mowing doesn't make sense, yeah, if you're on a smaller scale, you can replicate mowing through a weed whacker or string trimmer. There are ways to mow for diversity seasonally and or rotationally. Um, we do these in patches or strips. Again, we're always targeting these species uh, when they're most vulnerable. So when they're actively growing, um, that's gonna suppress them and weaken them. Flail mowing is really helpful because it breaks up that litter and it doesn't create just a thick mat that then um, you know, covers everything up and you know, prevents light and et cetera. Mowing at reduced speeds is beneficial for pollinators and many other critters to just allow them to escape and get to safety ahead of you. And of course, mapping the extent of the mowed area. So we want to be sure that we know how much we did, where we did it, and when we did it. Conservation hang can be applicable, especially for those in the Great Plains and Midwest. Um, it's awesome for suppressing woody vegetation. It's great for um, reducing light competition. And what I really love about it is the fact that it completely removes that vegetation from the site. So removing those excess nutrients uh, will favor your natives versus leaving them, which may be more beneficial to the unwanted species you're trying to manage. Um, I will say that for livestock producers, this might not be um, the best tool or maybe you could only do it once in a year because it could reduce um, biomass forage. And again, we want to be sure that we're leaving areas of um, refugia out there. So if it makes sense, um, depending on the size of your planting, you know, putting it or only cutting a third um, is what we generally recommend. Prescribed fire is a very common management tool. Um, very common in my neck of the woods. I have a lot of prescribed fire um, experience. I do, I continuously do volunteer work and um, do prescribed fires every year. Um, but it's important to do a pre-burn survey if you can, just to see what you have, uh, to make sure that you're timing it appropriately and you're not uh, negatively impacting any um, imperiled pollinators or other wildlife species. Um, again, we have a rule of thumb of not disturbing more than a third of the habitat, but if you have really small plantings, that can be um, very hard to accomplish and not always feasible. In Iowa, um, with our farm bill programs, like the Conservation Reserve Program, producers are able to burn an entire area if it's 20 acres or less. In other parts of the world, it's a more um, restrictive uh, threshold. So it might be, you know, five acres or less or three acres or less, you can burn the whole thing. Um, in certain areas, um, predominantly, you know, probably east of the Rockies, you can um, use Mother Nature to 
um, kind of manipulate your fire behavior to also create areas of refugia. Um, some techniques that I like to tell people is burning in um, lower temperatures, burning when you have a higher relative humidity, um, all of those things can kind of create a slow burn and more patchiness that might uh, be beneficial. So something to consider. Um, burn intervals will really depend on your site. Um, some people are just going to have to have a more rigorous burn schedule because of the weed pressure that they have, you know, thinking about trees specifically. Um, so that really depends on, on your, your site. Other folks might be able to get away with um, every three years or every couple years. Fire breaks are great, um, not just for safety and your own insurance, but also for creating those unburned areas and patches of refugia. In some cases, we're able to intercede with Forbes after a fire to increase that diversity, um, to fill that bloom gap, and if, again, mapping the area so that you know when, where, and um, yeah, when and where you burn. We have regional, regional considerations um, at the back of the document for every management technique, but I just went ahead and threw these in here for prescribed fire. Um, I don't have any experience in the West, but um, there are times that it may be more appropriate to burn depending on your, on your goal. We also have these for the East. So definitely something to check out in the back or if you're looking online at the bottom of the PDF. And now I will kick it off to Ray. Yay, that was so awesome, Sarah. Okay, and I think I've got control of the screen now, so we're good to go. <laughs> well, hi, everybody. I am so happy to be here, and um, thank you so much, Sarah, for all that awesome information. Um, and I'm just so happy to look at pretty pictures and so happy that the outside is starting to match some of those pictures, finally. It's been a long winter of Zoom presentations. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to keep going with management strategies, um, and I want to talk about conservation grazing. Um, and grazing for management. So in the context of sort of on-farm plantings and these smaller pollinator plantings, grazing may not always be feasible or relevant for some of these smaller sites. However, um, I think there are instances where grazing might be possible for smaller sites. And so I wanted to make sure we touched on that. Um, if you have cattle as part of your operation, um, that might be a time when you're able to use cattle or if you have a neighbor, who's willing to move you know, a small number of cattle for a short period of time um, onto your pollinator planting, that might be um, another time when grazing might be really beneficial um, to help maintain the diversity of your pollinator planting. Um, so when we manage grazing correctly, uh, it can be really uh, great to keep our dominant grasses sort of suppressed or in check um, and allowing our wildflowers to thrive, giving them some space um, to grow and get light. Um, again, the logistics can be a little funky on small sites because um, you got to think about running fencing, you got to think about water, and you got to think about moving on and off. How are we going to get them there? Um, but it, if, if it is possible or if you're on a bigger site, um, it can be a great tool. Uh, similarly to what Sarah was saying with a lot of our other management strategies, we want to make sure that we're leaving a refuge from grazing for part of that planting. Um, so having cattle on site, you know, if you're if you're grazing a little too hard, they'll start to take some wildflowers off site or all wildflowers off site. So you get that sort of immediate loss of food resources for pollinators. Um, additionally, uh, kind of the trampling action of cattle, um, the research of that on our ground nesting bees is still pretty deficient. So we just like to kind of be aware that that might have some impact on our ground nesting bees. Um, and finally, depending on the level and intensity of grazing, if you're removing a lot of those above ground stems, um, we've got stem nesting species that need those um, above ground stems. So those are kind of the reasons we think about, yeah, let's maybe not put grazing on the whole thing, um, but I'll give you a couple circumstances where that might work. Um, additionally, if you have other places on the farm or the landscape, um, you know, tree rows uh, that are flowering, that can also serve as sort of a refuge habitat for a lot of species. 
similar to the whole document and all of our management strategies, you know, it's really important to know your objective when you're bringing cattle on site um, and monitor your stocking rate so that if you're not meeting them, um, you know, you're not doing additional damage by having those cattle on site. So, you know, making sure we're getting out there and seeing what they're eating, what's getting taken down, um, what's still flowering. Um, you know, a lot of times that's going to be grazing to control grasses. So when we start to see them picking off wildflowers, it might be time to think about taking some cattle off. Um, and also making sure we're timing uh, when we've got cattle on site so that we've got fresh green growing plants um, and that's the plant we want to get rid of. <laughs> um, or, you know, we're doing winter grazing and we just would like to remove some of the litter from the site. So we do some winter grazing. So there's a number of objectives uh, with conservation grazing. Um, additionally, there's kind of two components of palatability of the plants on your site when we're talking about grazing. Um, the first of which is toxicity. Um, so some wildflowers are highly toxic to cattle. Um, so you just need to be aware if you have those on site. Um, some of those plants cattle will naturally avoid unless they're forced into a really intense grazing situation. Uh, other toxic species, they will just kind of mow through without, without a care. So make sure you know if you have any toxic plants on site. Additionally, some wildflowers are super tasty to cattle um, and they will preferentially graze them even over fresh new green grass growth. Um, so if you have some of those ice cream plants as we like to call them, you know, just being aware that this management strategy might be extra hard on those plants and making sure they get a rest after and that we're not grazing them off the site. All right, see if I can get us going, maybe. Oh, there we go. Okay, so here are um, some of our regional considerations and because our grazing guidelines definitely vary strongly by region. Um, most of the west coast and southwest and mountain region uh, a little bit drier and we want to make sure that we're deferring any grazing um, during that establishment year. So that would apply both to, you know, putting a new planting on the ground and also if we're doing an interseeding on a planting, we just wanna make sure those plants are getting established before we've got cattle on site. Um, and that would probably apply even to the Western Great Plains. Um, but other than that, with appropriate stocking rates, you can really graze in any season um, across most of the West, um, the Great Plains and the Midwest. Um, as we move into the East and also the Pacific Northwest, this isn't a commonly used management strategy in those regions. Um, although I'm sure some folks do it, uh, just your resources, your technical assistance might be a little harder to find. Um, in the Southeast, grazing is used as a management strategy. Um, they are, does tend to be more diverse grazers, like horses, goats, and sheep used in kind of unique landscapes like bulbs or boggy sites. This is one strategy of integrating fire and grazing. And I think there's a variety of ways you can put those two management strategy, strategies together. Um, Pathburn grazing is a common method in the Great Plains and Midwest in conservation areas. Um, so essentially you would have a fence around your entire pollinator planting that you have no interior fencing and you would burn a third or less um, of the site. And then you would bring cattle onto the site once you've got re-green um, after that burn. And they're gonna preferentially graze that new green grass growth. Um, and sort of those places that weren't burned in this year might get a little bit of grazing um, but are gonna be essentially refugia for a lot of those um, plants and insects. And you move that burn around through time. So the next year you burn a different third, um, you kind of keep doing that. So that just helps you manage your grazing intensity um, into a single area. So that's a super cool strategy. Um, one other technique you can use grazing for is broadleaf weed control. Um, and this is becoming more popular in some areas. And you didn't hear me talk about sheep or, sheep or goats too much in other grazing, and that's because uh, they tend to prefer to eat wildflowers um, instead of grasses or more than cattle do. Um, so they're usually not ideal for pollinator planting grazing because they tend to eat those wildflowers. Um, but that works in our favor <laughs> when we're trying to get a, rid of a flowering noxious weed. Um, and basically, if you've got a patch of you know a lot of weeds, if you can fence them into that area alone, and then you're going to want a pretty high grazing intensity to just kind of knock back all that vegetation, just have them eat it. 
Um, and this might be something that you have to use with other control methods, you know, come in with an herbicide after a couple of weeks and it's regreened. Might be a process that you repeat multiple times. Um, it tends to happen with really pernicious weeds. Okay. Like that. Oh. Sorry, my slide progression is a little wonky. Okay, so um, one method that we've been referring to um, is interseeding. So adding seed to a site um, to try to increase diversity. We have a whole other document <laughs> um, called Interseeding Wildflowers to Diversify Grasslands for Pollinators. And it really lays out the entire process of interseeding, you know, um, what you need to do before you interseed, how to select species to interseed, and, um, yeah, there we go. Different strategies depending on the vegetation you have on site. Um, so that do, does target places that are primarily grass dominant. Um, but if you're interceding, you know, into a site that's not grass dominant, I think those same um, tenets of how to do it, sort of prepare for it, do it, manage it after, um, would still be applicable. And that is also available on our website. Um, you can download the PDF. Maybe. All right, Nizzy, can you move mine forward? I'm sorry, it's not working for me. Thanks. Um, okay, plug or bare root planting is another way we can increase diversity on sites. Oh, now it's going too fast. <laughs> um, so if you've got a species that is really expensive as seed or the seed is just not germinating on your site, um, or you have a really small site and you just wanna guarantee the success of a certain species, um, that's a great time to use plug planting. Um, you do want to cluster those plugs or bare root plantings. That makes it easier to monitor. Also, if you're going to collect seed off of those um, new plants, that can help you find them and use those. Um, in a lot of areas, if you're using um, plugs or bare root plantings, you're going to want to go ahead and do irrigation. Um, pretty much anywhere in the West, you're, you're going to need irrigation for that first year or two for those plug plantings. Um, as you move east, it's a little less necessary, depending on the sort of general weather conditions of the year. Um, drip irrigation is a great way to make sure those plants are getting water. You can put it on a timer and schedule it. Um, if you do have drought conditions pretty much anywhere in the country, um, you're definitely going to want to have irrigation for your plug. And if possible, you can, and you can irrigate seeded site that's experiencing drought in year one would also benefit from irrigation. Um, if you're not able to irrigate a seeded site and it is a drought year in year one, um, you might have a lot of those wildflower seeds sit dormant in that drought year. Um, so you might see a lot of weeds, <laughs> uh, really drought tolerant weeds in year one. And I usually want people to wait an extra year or two to sort of um, evaluate the success of that planting, um, which is not to say you don't go in and do some management, but really call it a failure um, or a success because a lot of those seeds will sit dormant and they might come up in that next year that you have a regular water regime. Um, so that can kind of delay your establishment phase if you've got a drought condition in year one. Um, okay, next slide, please. Thanks. All right, finally, this situation that no one wants to land in, <laughs> where it's really gonna be most cost-effective and efficient to start over. Um, this is a situation where you've got, you know, such an invasion of noxious weeds, um, invasive weeds, it's dominant, it's going to be a real headache to try to work around it, um, even to intercede, and you just, you're just gonna start over. Um, typically, this involves a non-selective herbicide application, so you're just trying to eradicate all of the vegetation on site um, and get to a bare ground situation. Um, a lot of times, I want to see a growing season of weed control, so after you've eradicated it, do an entire season of weed control. Um, and You can do that with a chem fallow system, so you're spraying every couple of weeks, um, which is seems like a lot, um, but can be really effective for getting sort of a weed seed free bed. Um, solarization is another technique that we've used um, where you're laying plastic over the site, kind of securing the edges, and that can help eradicate weed seed there too. 
if you do have a small amount of native seeds present on a site where you're basically giving up on it, um, you might consider collecting the seed from those native species and then using it when you got a clean site. All right, next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, so this um, is coming out of the document and this is sort of getting us started on walking down that decision tree of which management technique to use. Um, so this is going out on your site and you'll do a lot of this with some monitoring and evaluation tools that Sarah went over um, earlier in the presentation. But you'll kind of have one of three scenarios going on. Man, you are winning at life. Desirable species are at least 75% of the site. You're doing great, good job. <laughs> um, the second scenario is, you know, most of your stuff that you planted came up. Definitely some weed issues happening. I've got a mixture of both. Um, or finally, you're in that category of this does not look great. 70% or more of the plants on site are unwanted species, they're weeds. Um, those are kind of the three pieces or the three scenarios you might run into. And then you'll see the next column is sort of, you know, is it lacking a bloom period if you're in the good categories? Um, what kind of weeds are we looking at? Are they woodies? Um, are they grasses? Uh, it kind of breaks it down into all these different scenarios that you might run into. Next slide. So then we have these decision tree pages and um, I think these are so useful and there's so much information on every page that I'm gonna walk you through it a little bit, but I would just suggest to spend a lot of time with these and really look at each category um, as you're working through them because they contain a lot of really awesome information about how to decide which management strategy to use, what you have on site. Um, I, I just really think this document will be super helpful for a lot of people. Um, so on sites dominated by desirable species, we're even going to go through and ask, do I have a diversity of species? Um, or is it just one, you know, one species I, that I planted came up in mass, um, which can be good, but we definitely want to make sure we're having the rest of the bloom period and other plant functional groups. So it'll kind of walk you through how to add those, even if you're in a pretty good place. Um, Kind of there at the bottom that's cut off you know okay i've got a lot of different species it's blooming throughout the season um then there's going to just be some recommendations of let's, let's keep you there how do we keep you there um so these are in the document um and yeah you can see they're just full of info um next slide please um for the mixture of sites Again, it's going to kind of walk you through and ask you, what's the situation? What kind of weeds do you have? Here's how we can deal with it. And it'll give you several strategies. So if, you know, you're not really into doing herbicide, well, we can try some prescribed fire or some hand weeding. Um, I'm not able to use grazing. Well, can we try mowing for weed control? So hopefully you can find the management activity that kind of matches where you're at in your situation. And next slide. That final category of unwanted species, focusing in on, do you have a whole variety of weeds? <laughs> Are they gonna need a whole plethora of different management strategies to get at those specific life cycles of the weeds? Or are we just dealing with, you know, a couple of different situations, um, a couple of different species that we can maybe get around? Next slide. So those are the decision trees, you'll see those. Um, there's also a management log. So like we've been emphasizing, monitoring, evaluating where you're at when you start, enacting that management, and then reevaluating and saying, did that management do what I wanted it to do? Did it do it enough? Do I need to do it again? Um, I think if you click here, Sarah, um, that annual management is, it can be a moving target. It can be time intensive. It can be money intensive. But in the long run, it is more effective than having to start over again and again. And go ahead. Next slide. There it is. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go through three different case studies with you guys, and then we will move over to questions. And I've got some notes here because I didn't work on any of these projects personally, but um, 
they these case studies are also in the document. So if you are like, man, that really sounds like my situation, um, they're the, the last bit of the documents. So you can go and read more. So this was a pollinator planting on a blueberry farm in Oregon. Um, and it was uh, it's just half an acre. It was initially seeded in 2012. And um, this planting did not, they didn't plant any grass seed. Um, there was a lot of non-native invasive grasses on the farm um, that would be, you know, reinvading constantly. And the farmer wanted to be able to have grass selective herbicide as a management option so he could, you know, spray over the wildflowers and remove those non-native grasses and not kill his wildflowers. So it was a wildflower only seed mix. Um, as you can see in May of 2013, it actually is coming up pretty good. They had good wildflower establishment. However, they were really missing that bloom period, um, July and August. They weren't seeing a lot of blooms initially. Um, so they decided to do an interseeding um, and interseeded some later blooming species. Um, so you can see there in July of 2014, um, they did have quite a bit blooming at that time. That looked gorgeous to me. Um, however, circled there are some Queen Anne's lace. Uh, they also had some issues with um, Western salsify, or we call it goat's beard here, um, another sort of just annual weedy species. And so they're having ongoing management um, and they hand weed or deadhead those every year just to kind of prevent seed spread, both in the pollinator plantings and in the nearby crop fields. Um, this site also has Himalayan blackberry is um, an invasion risk. So they are actually annually mowing this planting just so that that Himalayan blackberry can't get a foothold on this pollinator planting. So I think this is a really good example of kind of knowing what problems you have before you start <laughs> and managing those through time. Um, and then also kind of adapting and adding seed as needed um, and keeping it really pretty flexible for the farmer. So he can have you know, those flowers and be bringing in those pollinators, but also you know, not having to spend a lot of time trying to remove grasses from that planting. All right, let's go on to the next case study. And I think Kelly was probably involved in this one. So Kelly, if you wanna chime in at all, feel free to go ahead and do that. Um, so this was a one acre planting on an apple orchard in Pennsylvania. Um, and it was initially planted in 2011. Um, prior to planting, it had um, a lot of invasive weeds on site. Um, so things like field bindweed, um, snapweed, and non-native thistles. Um, they mowed and tilled the site uh, before planting, but that didn't really remove any of the invasive weed pressure. And so when they planted their wildflowers, um, they often take a little bit longer to establish than a lot of our weeds coming back or even from seed. And so it kind of got swamped by some of those same weed issues. Uh, however, they did have some high quality plants coming in like asters and goldenrods. Um, so they didn't want to just completely start over, um, but it definitely needed a little bit of a retooling. Um, so they went in and flail mode several times uh, in 2013 to try to just get as much of the weed vegetation off as they could and also to remove some litter. However, they really did very little soil disturbance because uh, they didn't want to bring back up some new weed seed. Um, then they interseeded with some wildflowers and they had um, pretty good success as you can see there in April of 2015, um, a lot more flowers. So the white on the left is all field bindweed. <laughs> so not desirable flowers. Um, and on the right, we've got you know things like bee balm um, and sunflower coming through and echinacea. Um, However, you can see in the foreground, I think that's a knapweed or maybe a caniza. Um, so they are still having some spot issues with weeds. So they do do some um, like mowing of weed patches. And also I thought this was interesting um, in areas, uh, small areas of bindweed patches that are coming up, you know, they're vining all through desirable plants. And so they either hand cut at the base or they can do some string trimming at the base um, of that convolvulus or bindweed. Um, so you don't disrupt your desirable plants. So pretty intensive management activities, but um, seem like feasible and they're doing a pretty good job at keeping things under control um, and dealing with some of those ongoing weed issues. All right, we'll go on to our last case study. 
And this is from California, um, an almond orchard in California. Um, this was on a half acre site and it was started in 2010. Um, this is on an almond farm, but it's surrounded by some um, native degraded grasslands. Um, and they had really great establishment of native grasses. So you'll see that photo on the left in June of 2013. Um, they had some really nice native bunch grasses established, but little to no wildflowers um, within that site. So um, to try to get some of that missing diversity back in, um, they mowed it and they actually shallowly disked this site. Um, because of that good native grass establishment, there's a lot less risk of bringing up a lot of new weed seed um, because they've had that grass down for three, four years. Um, then they went ahead and seeded it and they've got pretty good wildflower establishment after that um, interseeding. They do mow the perimeter of this site to try to prevent weed encroachment um, and they do an annual fall mow um, to kind of get some of the litter off of this site from all those native grasses um, have a lot of vegetation. But um, I think that's looking pretty good. Um, so those are a few case studies we have. Um, Kind of using this document, using this tool um, to help guide you through management. Um, and you can see it is a little bit, it can be a little bit different depending where you are, your weed pressures and what your like prior vegetation history was. Um, okay, now I'll just talk to you a little bit about resources and then we'll take questions. All right, so all the documents we talked about today, uh, as well as a plethora of other documents can be found at our website, Xerces.org. Um, Everything is available for a PDF download for free. Um, we've got plant lists. We've got information about monarchs. We've got um, information about native seed vendors in your region, uh, all kinds of information at Xerces.org. Um, so that's definitely a really great place to start. Next slide. Um, we do a lot with community science. <laughs> that's my dog, Helen, if you can hear him. <laughs> These are a couple of documents we have. Um, which are really great if you're just getting into sort of pollinators and invert ID, they kind of can help you start grouping insects, uh, especially bees and butterflies. Um, I really love that upper Midwest citizen science side. Um, it's a really good tool to start, start IDing your bee groups. Next slide. Um, this presentation, as well as a, a whole boatload of <laughs> a pandemic year Zoom presentations um, are available on YouTube and we're also on social media. So uh, find us, follow us. Um, we post some cool content there. Next slide. Yes, and as Sarah um, alluded to, we really don't do this in isolation. We have so many, so many supporters. Um, these are just some of the wonderful people that support us. I always really like to call out the USDA and Natural Resources Conservation Service since we are in partnership a lot of our positions and that was made possible um, through General Mills. So they're another one I always like to call out. Next slide. Finally, um, Xerces Jersey, is a donor supported nonprofit organization. Um, so I really encourage you to look into becoming a member and supporting our work. It helps you know keep us out on the ground and helping these little tiny creatures. Next slide. Um, finally, here is email contacts for both Sarah and I. Um, all of our staff contacts are available on the website. I know Sarah and I would be happy to field questions and to direct you to the CROC staff if you're not in our region, um, or feel free to take a look at our staff and um, find someone that's near you and reach out. Uh, we just we love to hear from everybody. <laughs> Um, and with that, I think we will um, go ahead and take some questions. I'll hand it over to Rachel. Thank you so much, Sarah and Ray. So we do have a few questions here. Definitely keep them coming through the Q&A. Okay, so our first question I think might be going to Kelly Gill. I'm not sure you guys can fight amongst yourselves <laughs> who wants to answer this one. Um, for prescribed fire, do you have someone come in who is experienced in that work, or do you get the training required and learn how to do it on your own? What else does that entail? Yeah, I'd be happy to answer that question too. Um, so when it comes to burning, um, at least in our kind of the Midwest, uh, we might be 
more spoiled compared to other um, regions. I'm not totally sure, but we do have a lot of, um, I shouldn't say a lot. We have contractors, um, private contractors who do that sort of work um, throughout the state. And I think, you know, in other, um, definitely within the upper Midwest that exists as well. Um, in Iowa, we have many fire departments that have been trained in prescribed fire. Um, so oftentimes, um, especially those with like farm bill programs, they will hire their local fire, fire department and generally they just have to give a donation. Um, if anyone is interested in getting certified with prescribed fire, um, there are uh, federal programs. You can get your S-130, 190 through, um, I'm not going to remember what the acronym is, but um, there is a level of certification for that that will teach you about fire behavior, safety, PPE, um, all of those things that I think would be beneficial if anyone is interested in potentially doing this on their own. Um, it's not a requirement. Um, oftentimes, it's also really beneficial to have burn plans uh, so that you know how to use the winds and you're taking, you know, landscape context into consideration, um, smoke, all of those things. So hopefully there are options available for you to contract that work out, um, but then there's avenues to learn more um, if you're interested. Thank you, Sarah. So this next question is for Kelly. How frequently is it best to water to maintain diverse stands of wildflowers? So um, I, I, it might be useful to ask this person where they are located. Here in the Northeast, we get substantial rainfall. We get enough rainfall where we do not water uh, um, a meadow seeding. So there's like a, a couple different buckets we have to talk about here, but if you seed a meadow, um, those, oh, Sacramento Valley, California. Okay, so you're gonna need to water. <laughs> um, it, it, it's, it's a very different monster here from the Northeast and, um, I think if you can follow up with me or somebody on this call, my email is kelly.gill at xerces.org or any of the emails you see displayed, we can put you in touch with our California staff um, because that's here in the Northeast, a very different animal as you can imagine. We don't water seedings here because it's, uh, it encourages weeds more than it does the wildflowers. In California, that's very different. And so I could get you information from our person in, in that area, because that's, you know, that's not my cup of tea. I don't know. Thank Ray or, or Sarah, you might, maybe you could answer that better. Um, I think the guidance, uh, for a lot of the West is water whenever it's dry to a depth of two inches. So I don't know how frequently that would be. <laughs> um, Jessa would definitely have a better idea. I imagine it's a fairly constant watering process. I know they run drip lines and stuff. Yeah. So especially yeah. for their tree and shrub planting. Yeah. Um, yes. Please, California person, get in touch with us afterwards. We'll, we'll help you out. Thank you so much, Kelly and Ray. All right, this next question is for Ray. Suggestions for a grass selective herbicide to use around broadly forbs and shrubs. Yeah, there are several grass selective herbicides. Um, Placidem is one that I've um, used with practitioners and has been really effective. Um, Amazepic uh, is another one uh, that for certain species of grass is really effective. Um, Sethoxidem is another one. Um, both Lysox, oh, excuse me, tongue, to, tongue twisters. Sethoxidem and another one, I think it's um, Fusilade is the product name. A couple of those, those two um, have been shown to reduce, um, I think, caterpillar survivorship. So I try to steer away from those. 
Um, so I think uh, Cethoxidem is like post, post infusal aid. Um, I try not to use those. Uh, so Clefidim and Amazepic are kind of the two I usually go with um, and have had seen success. Um, they're not always as effective uh, as a, like a broad uh, non-selective herbicide. You know, your kill might be a little bit less or it might take more applications, um, but they, they do kind of keep those wildflowers on site. And they've gone down in price a lot um, from when they were first, first came out. So it's a lot more feasible option than it used to be. Thank you, Ray. Another question for you. Where do you suggest sourcing your seed for California native wildflowers? And again, so sorry, we're not from California. Um, I was just going to go ahead and direct you to the website for that one. Um, we've got a pollinator conservation resource center, and you can just click on the map which region you're in, and that will take you to plant lists for pollinators, for monarchs. Um, it has regional vendors lists can also be found within that resource center. Um, or as we pointed out to the other California question, reach out to some of our California staff and um, they're working in that, in that region. Thank you. Okay, this is an exciting question. We have someone here from Mexico. Um, are there any Xerces resources adapted for Mexican wildflower for a Mexican wildflower context greetings from Tabasco? I don't think we have anything that would cover that. I mean, we've got lists for the Southwest and um, you know Southern Great Plains, so there might be some bleed over um, into Northern Mexico, but no, we, we don't have those resources outside of the US. We've worked outside of the US on certain projects though. Um, so if you reach out to one of us, we could kind of um, pull the staff because um, I know we do have some staff that um, have some experience in Mexico. Yeah, we um, recently have been working with a farm in Mexico um, and Steph, Stephanie Frucci, who's based out of Indiana, has been kind of the key um, point person. So she may be able to connect you with that specific farmer where you guys can share your resources. Okay, perfect. I will put Stephanie's email in the chat in just a second here. All right, Sarah, this question is for you. In the upper Midwest, have you seen a difference in the effect on Forbes in regards to fall versus spring burns? Yes, so it's um, commonly known that uh, spring burns, um, especially later spring burns, will favor uh, grasses over Forbes and that your fall or dormant season burns are going to basically burning any time between, let's say November, uh, to March is going to favor, favor Forbes. Um, so I think it's important um, to know that in terms of um, do your goals, do you want to be increasing your wildflower diversity or do you want to be combating specific weeds? Because um, that's ultimately going to determine your timing. Um, but I think it's also critical if you can um, if your site allows you to switch up the timings of your burns, um, where maybe initially you have to be targeting certain non-native cool season species where spring burns can be very beneficial um, at setting those back and kind of um, temporarily having a setback or, um, you know, with management, there's oftentimes kind of catch 22s um, that we just inevitably are going to be dealing with. But as time progresses, you may be able to do more dormant burns and you know you could do one in November and then later, you know, if there's no snow on the ground, you could do one in February. Um, the only caution with that is um, although the time frame in which in the upper Midwest it favors Forbes, you could be stimulating. Um, cool season non-native. So I think it's it's important to kind of get a handle on your planting and get to a good place where then you have more flexibility and freedom um, to more tailor and tier your management. Great, thank you, Sarah. This next question is for Kelly. Regarding interseeding in an okay site, do you usually recommend doing some minimal site prep like raking moving down to bare soil into patches to get soil contact with seeds, et cetera. Uh, 
to back up, we recommend significant amount of site prep. And that may be, um, uh, there's several methods we have outlined to do that. We have both organic and herbicide methods. Um, but the goal is, um, especially if you're starting with a weedy area, so there's, there's a kind of, um, uh, uh, you know, a, a span of different types of vegetation we could start with, a crop field coming out of production with low weed pressure is, you know, maybe ready to go right away for a seeding that season. Um, a, a, an area that's in between, kind of abandoned, has grasses, has weeds, has some native species is what we're usually dealing with. And then on the, on the worst situation, we're dealing with a totally infested area. So, you know, working on farms in my case, I, I, I totally understand a farmer's not giving up prime real estate to do habitat installation in most cases, not all, but it depends on what you start with. And yes, good site prep is, I mean, I can jump up and down, shout and scream about it. We, we really need that. We really need that upfront work to eliminate weeds, not just once, and it's not just one, one time till or one time herbicide spray or whatever the method may be, because you're going to get that regrowth and you need to deplete the non-dormant weed seeds in the top of that soil profile without disturbing the soil enough to let the dormant weed seeds that are deeper down emerge and cause a problem. So there is a, there is a lot of nuance and finesse to that part of the pro of the process. And I, I would say it's probably the most important part and the most boring part. You know, everybody wants to see flowers grow. They want to get to the planting part. They want to get to the part where they actually see results. And to get to that, you need to do this part where you don't get a lot of return initially, initially. Um, but yes, uh, site prep is, is very key. Um, and I can't emphasize that enough. Sarah, Ray, weigh in on your uh, regions if this differs. Um, I mean, no, that's absolutely like site prep first and foremost. And then when it comes to interceding um, and you've got like an okay site, but you know, you want to amp it up, uh, you still need to do some sort of suppression um, to knock back maybe some, some grasses of water there. You don't want to kill out anything, but um, stunting it by, you know, mowing or removing some of that vegetation so that you can get good seed to soil contact um, is critical. So it's, it's not exactly like starting over, but you might do some similar um, things just to ensure that the interseeding um, takes off. So that's all that I would add, but site prep is critical. And just this week alone, I've told three different people that have had pollinator plantings that the first year it sleeps, the second year it creeps, and the third year it leaps, ideally. <laughs> And I'll just jump on to kind of follow up with interseeding and um, to address also Jack's question um, about interseeding. Um, I'm not sure where you are, Jack, and it does kind of depend on the grass species that you're dealing with when you're talking about interseeding. Um, so in that guide, we definitely do lay out, you know, here are the species that it's a little, it's easier to interseed into, and there are some that are sort of like don't even try. <laughs> um, and I think someone asked later about reed canary grass, and that's one of those species that we just, we don't recommend interceding into reed canary grass. You're not going to be successful. You know, it really is a start over situation. Um, so it kind of depends on the grass species you're dealing with. Um, most native grass species are, we can do it, we can make it work. Um, the timing of the seeding also depends on where you are. Um, I prefer dormant season seedings here in the Great Plains because we get that cold moist stratification on those seeds over the winter time. Um, uh, in other places, 
they do spring seeding and have no issues. So the timing of that seeding kind of depends on where you are. And again, I would refer you to the inner seeding document, which has all kinds of details about those questions. Thank you so much, all three of you. Right, this question is for any of, any of you. On a typical pollinator planting, how many species of forbs are you adding in a mix? 20, 30, 40, and keeping the cost not too high. I'll start because I'm on, I'm okay. So here in Nebraska, in the Great Plains, um, and in general, in drier ecosystems, we tend to use less seeds per square foot. Um, Typically here on like a CRP pollinator planting, um, kind of a workhorse planting, 20 seeds per square foot is, is what we're putting down. Um, and that varies greatly as we move, move east as Sarah and Kelly will tell you. <laughs> but yeah, 20, 20 to 30 seeds per square foot is pretty much what we're putting down here in Nebraska and you know the Dakotas and further west. Yeah, here we range from 40 to 60 seeds per square foot, but we have a lot more moisture, which, um, well, there's complications with seed mixes anyway, which I won't get into, but um, we, we can get away with, a, a, I like the mid-range 50 here, because we have a lot uh, more weed suppression and uh, in the Northeast, everything wants to be a forest. So we have a lot more woody growth, I guess I'm uh, assuming than you do, Ray, in the, in the plains and in the prairie states. So we're kind of fighting a lot against nature with these plantings here in the Northeast. And so I would, I'm just going to put a two second plug in for flowering trees and shrubs in our forest lands, which I think is extremely undervalued. Yeah, and I'll just add that um, in Iowa and um, you know Minnesota, and I think again, kind of typical to our surrounding states to the east, Wisconsin and Illinois. Um, so I would for sure our minimum is 40 seeds per square foot. Um, we can do more. Um, you know, research suggests that, you know, more is better and with certain soil types um, that may be beneficial. So if we're dealing with wetter sites, the more seeds per square foot, the better. Drier sites, 40 seeds per square foot is probably fine. Uh, we generally have anywhere from 20 to 40 to 50 or more species in those mixes. Um, I'd say like middle of the road, especially for anyone participating in farm bill programs, uh, it's basically between 20, actually like 15 to um, maybe 25 to 30 species max for seed mixes. Um, and those all have to be 40 seeds per square foot. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you all. We have a couple of questions um, that really kind of get down to balancing management of invasive species in really large um, areas of land. So we have a question about burning and the impact of smoke in the environment. So maybe the, the pros and the cons of that. And then also herbicide use. Well, I'll tackle herbicide if you, one of you guys <laughs> wants to talk about burning or I can if, if nobody wants to. Um, you know, I think we do think about herbicides a lot and um, Xerces as a whole tries to be very thoughtful in the way we recommend herb herbicides. Um, they can have an impact on pollinators on site and other wildlife. Um, the fact of the matter is that a lot of the systems that we're working in are just really heavily invaded. And so over the long term, if we're reestablishing native vegetation, the overall gains for pollinators and other wildlife and even human health is probably higher than the negative impacts of short term herbicide use. Um, we do try to use herbicides that have a short residual. Um, so they're breaking down pretty quickly and not sticking around in the environment. But 
um, you know, it, it is something that we, we think about and are actively looking at research into the impact of urban lag. Yeah, and I'll um, attempt to tackle that um, prescribed fire uh, concern. Um, certainly, there are uh, some folks that uh, are concerned about kind of emissions with prescribed fire. Um, I don't know of any uh, research that really has measured the impact of that. Um, we know that historically, especially uh, within you know tall grass prairie ecosystems and prairie ecosystems that fire uh, historically, you know, was done by lightning strikes and vast vast acreages. You know, there was no no stopping it. Granted, those were very different times and, you know, humans, the industrial revolution hadn't happened and there's not all these other factors um, involved. But I think if anyone is concerned about that, um, I mean, people have had a hesitancy with prescribed fire, not only in that regard, but also just um, like a fear of fire. So there are other options out there um, for folks that don't want to burn or are um, concerned about those issues. You know, there's other management tools that may be able to work um, that could replicate uh, what fire can do. Um, it really just depends on your scenario and how big your site is and what you have available to you. But it's um, for better or worse, especially within the upper Midwest and other places, um, I don't want to say it's the quick and easy, but it's what our ecosystems were um, evolved with and uh, can be very effective. But I'd love to see, you know, research if it exists. I'm unaware of it. Um, it may exist, but into looking at that. And Kelly, I don't know if you have any additional thoughts or anyone else. I guess I would I just add the benefits of fire um, in the Great Plains in dealing with tree invasion into our prairies, which, you know, historically was not such a threat because of fire. And to see these, you know, beautiful grasslands when you're driving on the highway or the interstate and you see an invasion of um, Eastern red cedar and you just know in three years without any fire, that's gonna be a forest of cedar and cedar only. Um, you know, that really sells it in my mind <laughs> uh, to preserve, preserve our prairies and our pollinators that live on them. Yeah, I think with, with um, here in the Northeast, in, in a lot of the states, um, fire is used very minimally and, uh, and to, much to my chagrin, I guess. Um, but we've, we have a, a highly populated area. So the uh, rules and regulations are very strict and almost, um, you know, uh, concentrated on large forest lands, state owned lands, those types of places. Um, unfortunately, we can't do a lot of burning on our restoration sites because there's neighbors close by and re other restrictions. Um, and so we're forced into looking at these other options, which may be mechanical mowing, um, you know, mowing to reduce some of those woody species. But a lot of times we do have to use herbicide and, um, you know, in this situation compared to an annual cropping system where it's used over and over again, multiple times a year to treat weeds, we're trying to use it in a very specific manner in a very targeted manner to treat invasive species, which if we left them alone, like you can see in many other parts of our landscape, roadsides or abandoned lots or whatever it may be, they will take over. And while some of those species do produce flowers that pollinators will feed on, it's only for this very small window of time. So like you could eat from July 1st to the 7th, but otherwise, if that particular plant is allowed to just proliferate through our landscape, that's all you got. And so we're trying to kind of 
balance that herbicide use for those species that are displacing native plant communities and, and in turn, the animals that depend on them um, in a way that's, that's sustainable. And it's a balance and it's, it's not always um, well-received. <laughs> All right, thank you all for answering that. I know it's a very complicated uh, question. Yeah. You're all very knowledgeable, so I thought um, <laughs> I thought I'd throw it at you um, today. So another question: Do you have a percentage of grass to Forbes as a general site goal in the Midwest? Um, I think it varies, and if you're talking a kind of a general pollinator planting. Um, when we first started doing a lot of pollinator plantings with the farm bill, um, we were at 75% forbs and 25% grass. Um, and in evaluating some of those plantings that went in in you know, 2011 and earlier, um, we found a lot of weed issues. And so um, now we're able to include up to 50% grass um, and 50% wildflower seed. Um, and I think that's a fair balance. So I usually range somewhere between 50 to 75. Um, wildflower seed, usually a, not as quite as high as 75, usually about 66. So about two thirds wildflower seed, one third grass is about as high as I go with wildflower seed. Um, and again, that seeds per, per square foot kind of varies depending on project and region. And I would echo that that's um, very similar um, east of Ray. And um, I, and it also just depends on the site and the weed pressure and soil types. Um, some areas may be able to get away um, with 25% grasses, 75% forbs, but um, I advocate a lot for 50-50 or like Ray said, somewhere around two thirds to a third um, seems to be beneficial. And then if, you know, we're thinking about sites that get a lot of water or hold a lot of water or are in riparian areas um, or along river corridors and you're thinking about doing a pollinator mix, um, I would caution against that just because the weed pressure is going to be um, pretty extensive, especially in like within, you know, the upper Midwest region. And, um, you know, it would be more advantageous to have more grasses, but you could certainly um, intermix some aggressive forbs if you did want at least a component of that. So perhaps flipping the coin and having 75% grasses, 25% flowers. And then designing the seed mix to really um, compete against some of that unwanted vegetation that inevitably is going to want to invade those areas because of the moisture and soil conditions and likely the, the previous existing conditions. <laughs> 